Hello, um, I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our series of Women's Rights in Healthcare webinars. Um, my name is Stephen Jones. I'm a partner in Lee Day's medical negligence team based in our Manchester office. And the topic of today's discussion is endometriosis, the hidden disease. Um, and our first speaker later on will be um, one of my clients, Francis Bell, um, whose case um, attracted some media publicity recently and um, following the success. And Fran was very brave, I think, in publicizing um, her claim. Um, she wanted to get a message out about endometriosis and um, she'll have more to say about that later. Um, our second speaker later on will be Andrew Baxter. He's a consultant gynecologist. He trained in Manchester and he completed a fellowship in minimal access surgery before becoming a consultant at the Royal Hallamshire in 2002. Um, he's a specialist in keyhole surgery and his areas of expertise include the investigation treatment of abnormal uterine bleeding and endometriosis. And he's lead for the Sheffield Endometriosis Centre. And his evidence was absolutely crucial to us in um, bringing Fran's claim on her behalf. He's a national trainer and he's a specialist in laparoscopic and hysteroscopic surgery. And his interests include management of abnormal uterine bleeding, the treatment of endometriosis, um, day surgery keyhole hysterectomy, and outpatient gynaecology. And then we'll be hearing from Emma Cox, who is the Chief Executive of Endometriosis UK. Um, and she joined them in that role in February 2016. Um, and Endometriosis UK, I think, have a really vital role to play here. Um, they have recently been successful on a number of fronts, including campaigning to get menstrual well-being included in the new school curriculum in England starting this year, so that we can overcome the taboo and embarrassment of talking about periods. So in the future, no girls or young women suffer as they're told what they're experiencing is just normal and they have to put up with it. So Emma's background is a strategic change management specialist She's got over 25 years experience gained working in volunteering membership organisations, including Diabetes UK, NUS and the Chartered Quality Institute. Um, so I'll introduce the first speaker in a moment, but just a quick word. Why did we decide to do this? Um, and I think the, the reason we decided to put this webinar on was really after Fran told her story, we were overwhelmed with inquiries from women who'd suffered in very, very similar ways to Fran. I think we've had something like 40, 45 women contact us with very similar stories, and that's too many, frankly. Um, and there's some interesting information that I'm sure Emma will share with us in terms of how poorly um, endometriosis, is un endometriosis is understood and treated. Um, a lot of interest in terms of who's here today, there's over a hundred people listening, um, including Fran, Helen, um, Helen Mulholland, who was our barrister in that particular case. So welcome particularly to Helen. Um, so I'll go straight over to you, Fran. Hi there, I'm Fran. Um, thank you, Stephen. I thought we could start this just by sharing my story so that, um, those of you who haven't heard it before can listen. So my period started at the age of 12. Um, the first couple of months were uneventful, but then they started getting worse and worse. Um, I remember that there was a lot of burning, cramping uh, during my period, just after my period. Um, I even passed out sometimes. I had a lot of toilet issues. I was taking a lot of tablets, probably way too many tablets for a teenager. But also once my periods became more regular, I was having a lot of time off to school. Um, so sometimes within the month, I was having a full week off every single month. I went to the GP a lot of times. Um, I have to say I didn't have the best GP. He was um, very unsympathetic, made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, his 
the solution to it was it was totally normal for girls to have period pain to start taking the contraceptive pill you know with breaks it will be fine but my experience was it just got worse and worse and worse um as a, a teenager i had no social life because any time that i was on my period or leading up to it i was at home i was on medication i was very upset and it got to the point where um, one evening my parents had to take me to A&E um, because I had some really bad stabbing pains. It just became completely unbearable one evening. Um, I think I had sickness and diarrhea. I, w I, rem I remember not being able to stand upright and I certainly couldn't walk. So my poor parents took me to A&E who could do nothing. I mean, what, what could they do apart from give me more painkillers, which they did, but they agreed to write to my GP to convince him to refer me to the hospital, which they did. And when I went to the hospital, um, they gave me an examination, said, no, you don't have endometriosis. You, your symptoms aren't uh, suggestive of that at all. But they did find that my uterus was retroverted. And their solution was to take the pill without any breaks, therefore taking away my periods, therefore I wouldn't have any pain. And that was the end of the matter. But things got worse and worse and worse. My GP continued to be dismissive. I was at the GP every month for another prescription to the pill. They didn't really care. So I thought I'd take things into my own hands. And at this point, I must have been about 17. And I actually bought this book. This book was delivered all the way from America. And it had a list of symptoms on one of the front pages of endometriosis, which suggested that it was heavy or irregular bleeding, fatigue, painful bowel movements, lower back pain, diarrhea, constipation which kind of cemented my view that that's what I had. So after three visits of begging my GP to refer me, off I went to the hospital again and I took my book. And the consultant I saw wasn't happy with me. He did not like that I was suggesting that I had this disease. Um, he wrote a letter to my GP um, after he saw me in reply to a really, really horrible letter that my GP sent to him. My GP said to him that I'd convinced myself I had endometriosis. I actually have my letters in front of me and I'm reading from them. Convinced herself she has endometriosis. She does have symptoms suggested of IBS and I think there's a degree of anxiety present and she also seems highly strong. So I went to sit, I went to the hospital. Um, he didn't examine me properly. He was very dismissive of my book about endometriosis, even though my history in front of him was exactly the same as the history or the symptoms in this book. And he was very offended. And he then wrote to my GP after uh, my consultation and said that my symptoms were very vague and it absolutely had IBS. He, um, he did note during the examination that I had a lot of pain around my colon, which is where in 2015 the actual laparoscopy found a lot of the disease. So the signs were there in effect. But I feel as though he made his mind up about me even before I'd walked in. He decided I was anxious, I was silly, I was a silly girl who just needed to be told, you know, you don't have it, go and get on with your life. But I didn't want to leave empty handed. So I convinced them to send me for a scan, an ultrasound scan, which is the best he could offer me. And that showed that one of my ovaries was missing which really should have been enough to warrant a laparoscopy, which was the gold standard way of diagnosing or dismissing endometriosis at that stage. But um, no, he didn't want to do that. He sent me home with the pill, told me not to take any breaks and to come back when I was ready to have a baby. And he said this to me when I was 18 years old. 
So they diagnosed me with IBS, but they didn't treat me for IBS. Um, if they had treated me for IBS, they would have realized I didn't have that. They would have moved on to the next condition and eventually they would have found out I had endometriosis. But anyway, 14 years later, um, my physical and mental health really suffered. I kept diaries throughout this entire time of my symptoms, which were like three, three to four months of constant bleeding. I had chronic pain, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, bleeding from my bowel, fainting, tiredness, backache. And at no point in any of my GP visits on a monthly basis did anyone say, this is strange, perhaps we should look at this a bit further. But going on through the years, I knew something was wrong with me. I knew it even before I was diagnosed. I was convinced I had endometriosis, which in effect I did. I did have it. And I told my husband when I met him when I was 28 that um, I might have something. They say I haven't, but I'm sure I do. Are you sure you want to marry me? And luckily I'd found someone who was very understanding and committed. So um, two weeks after we got married, I was diagnosed by a laparoscopy. I had to change my GP. Um, I saw a female GP. She sent me to a female consultant, straight in for a laparoscopy, and there we go. Stage four, um, adenomyosis as well. Um, and then I was given a choice. I had to choose either pain management or have a baby. So I didn't have any children at that point, so I chose to have a baby because the alternative would have been a hysterectomy. Um, so I had two further laparoscopies. I was further diagnosed with premature ovarian failure, which meant that I needed to use a donor egg to conceive. But I had one uh, round of IVF, which was successful. Um, it was a terrible pregnancy um, because my placenta wouldn't stay attached to my uterus. They think it was because of my adenomyosis. Um, the C-section was a nightmare. I lost over two litres of blood because my insides were so stuck together with scar tissue that they cut through a few things that they shouldn't have. But anyway, Harry had a hard start to life, but he is an absolutely spectacular two-year-old who's currently destroying the house upstairs. I can hear him. Uh, we would love to have more children, but it's just not going to happen. So, um, but anyway, the reason why I started my legal case was that initially we were um, refused funding for the IVF. At that point, everyone in Derbyshire was entitled to one free round of IVF and they refused to fund me. Um, so I started an appeal and a part of that appeal was to get hold of my medical file, which is where I found those spectacular letters um, of my two male doctors calling me stupid, calling me highly strong. Um, and I then contacted Stephen Jones um, at Lee Day, who was the first person to really listen to me. And it was, it was really lovely to be told that my story was important and well, it, it was daunting to discuss personal information with a stranger but it was necessary just to do the right thing. I actually found that the hardest part of the whole process was visiting some of the uh, medical experts. Some of them were very kind and supportive. Andrew Baxter, you were fantastic. I have nothing bad to say about you at all. It was a pleasure. But when I went to see um, one doctor uh, for the defence in London, it was an absolute disaster. I travelled for two hours to see him. He was an hour late. He turned up with nothing but a pen. He spent the entire time telling me that my symptoms couldn't have been down to endometriosis, even though I'd already been diagnosed and the NHS had already admitted the unfair treatment just kind of goes to show that even after 17 years nothing's really changed still and I was really shocked. Um, so my story was printed in a local paper and via that paper the NHS Trust who treated me so badly actually apologised 
via that paper, although I'm still kind of hoping that they get in touch one day and apologise in person. I don't know if that's going to happen. But there's still a lot of stuff to be done to change the attitudes of some of these medical experts. I kind of hoped that my case was the worst that ever happened, but speaking to some ladies on um, the Facebook Endo pages and the support groups, there's a lot of it going on and it's still going on. And there are a lot of women who also want to be heard just like I'm finally being heard. And hopefully events like today will help things change. But I think that's everything I've got to say. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Fran. That was um, really interesting and um, particularly interesting for me, actually, as, as a solicitor to, to hear about your experience of the legal process as, as well as the sort of medical process. Um, there's room for questions at the end of all this, but um, I'll now move on to Andrew Baxter. Um, and I think something that Fran said um, in her talk emphasizes the importance of, of Andrew's role in all of this because um, Fran's experience with the defendant's medical expert was really negative. Um, it was exactly the opposite with Andrew. Andrew really went above and beyond and and help sort of recommend the way forward for Fran in terms of treatment and moving on, um, as well as doing his job as a medical legal expert. So we're immensely grateful to him. Um, one interesting comment that Andrew made when he first prepared his, his report, he was critical of the treatment that Fran had had, but he said, look, the treatment of endometriosis is so poor in this country that the defendants might argue um, that actually, even though it was poor, that's the standard. Um, so, Andrew, over to you to tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and like Fran says, I'm happy to take part in these sort of things because I appreciate that there's still a lot to be done um, at every stage, really, both from the patient's point of view, GP's point of view, secondary care, clearly, as we've heard in this case. Um, and there's, there's problems at every stage, really. Um, like Fran referred to, when I was training, it's not that long ago, well, 30 years ago, uh, the, 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 the sort of the reading was it's seven years to diagnosis for endometriosis. Um, and I was looking it up recently before this talk, and it's the same. Um, the, re the recent data is still around seven years, Norwegian data, four and a half years, American, five to 15 years. And it seems to be across a lot of countries, including the UK, it's still slow to diagnose. And as Fran points out, this disease has severe impact in terms of your daily life, in terms of your ability to work, in terms of your ability to have children. Um, for the non-medics in, in, the, in the audience, um, if you read the books that Fran showed up, I've got that book as well. Um, it, you know, the classic endometriosis story is cyclical pain with periods you're told as a medical student, then it might spread out to the whole month. It might, the actual worst pain you might get is with ovulation mid cycle, in fact, it might not be with period pain. Then, as the scarring process really takes hold over the years, you might end up with constant chronic pelvic pain, which is just there all the time. Um, the questions that medical students are told to ask and you really need to be quite direct with is rather than saying, have you got a problem with your bladder? Have you got a problem with your bowel? Most people will say, if you've got a problem with your bladder, you're talking cystitis type symptoms, burning, that sort of thing. Endometriosis in your bladder is a bit more of a stretchy pelvic ache type pain. And unless you specifically ask about when you get the pain and where you get the pain, you might miss that. Um, similarly with your bowels, you might just say, are your bowels okay? Might be a sort of a question a medical student, GP might ask, or indeed a hospital doctor. Unless you specifically, again, like Fran says, it's not nice getting into talking about the, the details, but basically the common symptom when you're having endometriosis on your bowel is you sat on the toilet, period time especially, you can imagine your inflamed bowel gets distended with a hard stool. Sorry, it's tea time, isn't it? But anyway, um, 
and women describe this poker up the backside, up the vagina type pain that they're almost falling off the loo. So unless you get specific with these questions, you might miss details. Um, so, in t and then all that has a huge knock on in terms of quality of life. People don't sleep. People don't, can't go to work. They can't go out to do their, what they want to do, whether it's line dancing or gym or whatever. And that has a knock on in terms of being tired, you get depressed if you're in the group of women in the stage of life who want to get pregnant and can't get pregnant added into that you've got that impact in their quality of life so when you look at the the hard data for women and getting interviewed for quality of life scores with endometriosis it has a significant impact on their quality of life um why there's a delay in diagnosis i think a lot of the time Patients aren't like Fran, they don't go to the GP as a teenager. They think this is normal periods. Maybe that's the impression they get from their family, from their friends. Some girls may not want to talk about it. Perhaps they just think it's just the one quote I heard in one of the, the because there's, again, there's good papers on why people don't go to the GP. Uh, some people just think they're unlucky rather than ill was a phrase I read, which was quite good descriptive, basically. Uh, they think that's just the way it is for them. Um, other times, like Fran, you go to your GP and you get bounced off, you get ignored slightly, um, you're told it's a normal period. Um, and this isn't GP bashing, because you can see a large part of Fran's story is all about secondary care. This is about hospital doctors. So I think it's not, you know, the GPs see lots of different problems. They see lots of IBS. They see lots of interstitial cystitis with the bladder. So they see lots of symptoms. And I think it's just a case of referring on, um, just being aware that it might well be endometriosis and refer on. In terms of what GPs can do, um, you can do a scan. Uh, an ultrasound scan is fairly straightforward. That excludes basically other things uh, you'll see a cyst due to endometriosis on an ultrasound scan but an ultrasound otherwise is going to be normal but I think it's that appreciation that a normal ultrasound scan does not exclude endometriosis is important because otherwise they get the scan done and they're told well your scan's normal so therefore you do not have a gynecological pathology and I think it's that not accepting that and getting referred on for a specialist opinion at that stage is fairly crucial. It's not, apart from the diagnostic laparoscopy, the keyhole, look inside your tummy, um, there's nothing, there's no perfect test for endometriosis. Um, so, um, in terms of secondary care, again, secondary care specialists will, you know, I'm hoping that sort of slightly paternalistic, you know, well, more than slightly paternalistic, uh, attitude is, is fading out, um, but you might not get referred into a, a specialist centre. Uh, since 2011, there are endometriosis centres set up around the UK. Just to be clear, those endometriosis centres are specifically for the bad cases with bowel disease. That's what they're fundamentally being set up for. They're not, they do obviously treat all stages of endometriosis, um, but, but there's a slight, you know, they've made a problem of our own making, really, because by being so full now with severe cases, you, even if you get referred to an endometriosis centre, you still may not get seen by an endometriosis specialist. It sounds slightly bizarre. It's just straight practicalities of having enough theatre time to do every single case of possible endometriosis. So the upshot of that is you still, at an endometriosis centre or not, you get lots of laparoscopy is done by non-specialists in endometriosis. So you might actually still have a diagnostic laparoscopy, perfectly reasonably medical legally, by the way, um, but not treated, which you can argue is bizarre. If you're going through the risk of a laparoscopy, any surgical procedure has a risk, and you have no real chance of getting treated at that laparoscopy. And that's again a problem with secondary care that we just do not have the capacity to every single case of possible endometriosis be treated by an endometriosis specialist. So, I mean, that again, so there's issues with secondary care. Um, but a laparoscopy is crucial. 
I mean, even a diagnostic laparoscopy is better than not having a laparoscopy, but it gives people a diagnosis. Uh, you've gone from just having painful periods to being diagnosed as to what's going on. Perhaps it's negative, but that's fine. So you can move on in terms of treatment. Um, but it, it's gone from just some of the painful periods and perhaps having to take time off school, time off work with just because it's your period and perhaps not getting a sympathetic ear from either your teachers or your employer. If you have endometriosis and it's a flare-up of endometriosis that's causing you to take time off or miss things, it's supportive for the woman. You know, they've got a, it's, it's not a badge, it's not something, you know, but it's a diagnosis that, you know, you can tell people that's what's causing me to be limited in my activities at this time of the month, for instance. Um, and, it, you know, if you have endometriosis, you can then get support. I mean, the, you know, endometriosis.uk or other groups, it gives you support. You feel like you're not just going crazy. So many um, patients I have who come along who have a laparoscopy and you go along afterwards and some you find nothing. And in a sort of crazy paradoxical way, they're disappointed not to have endometriosis because they've got this pain, but they haven't got a diagnosis. But moving to a diagnosis is really important. And that the only way of moving that forward is really a laparoscopy. Um, in terms of, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'll get into all the treatments for endometriosis. It's probably not the place to discuss all, all types. But I think in terms of what to ask your specialist if you're going along to the hospital for a consultation, I think it's important to ask, will they treat it at the time? Because I think if, if patients push for to have an operative laparoscopy from the off, that will encourage the services to develop to the capacity to cope with that. Um, I still think it's, it's, you can't really justify doing a diagnostic laparoscopy and then subjecting someone to a second laparoscopy further down the line just to treat the condition. Um, but, you know, as I say, in secondary care, we've still got plenty of issues to address. We've got that issue about capacity. We've got issues about chronic pain management. Um, chronic pain services across the UK aren't good enough. They're not funded. It's, it's a difficult thing to fund um, because the tariffs that drive NHS work don't really cope with a chronic pain service. And I think one of the, one of the BSG meetings is up to 50% of gynecologists thought they weren't managing chronic pain well. So I think there's lots can be done across the whole service um, in the secondary care as well. Um, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I suspect there'll be quite a few questions for you in particular at the end. So um, yeah, that's maybe fine. we can sort of pull them together and, and, and deal with them at that point. Um, over to Emma. Um, I mentioned before about her role with um, endometriosis UK and just looking at um, their website there's some quite shocking sort of facts really um, one in ten women of reproductive age in the UK suffer from endometriosis and it's the second most common gynecological condition the prevalence of endometriosis in women with infertility could be as high as to 30 to 50 percent endometriosis costs the UK economy eight Point two billion pounds a year in treatment, loss of work, and healthcare costs. Um, so, obviously, a huge health issue. Um, and Emma, over to you to sort of explain the role that um, the charity sort of adopts and and how you're hoping to improve things generally for women. Thank you, Stephen, and a massive thank you to Fran for taking the time and being brave to share her story, and obviously to Andrew for his help and support. Um, I'd like to say Fran's is an unusual story, but it isn't, sadly. It is one I hear often. Um, and bear in mind, we're the charity, so we hear the worst cases, so let's bear that in mind to begin with. People rarely ring up, so I had a great time. Um, we do know, I think what what the thing that really strikes me is the sheer difference in treatment and service that people get across the UK. So we know that the average time to diagnosis is seven and a half years. Um, 
Now that's an average and we know people get diagnosed really promptly because the symptoms are recognised and they might get diagnosed in under a year and for every person diagnosed in under a year someone is 15 plus years. So I think we talk about an average of seven and a half years and I'll talk about that a little bit what that means but that really does hide a massive curve in some excellent and some great work that's done in, by healthcare professionals in diagnosing and sadly some less so good work as Fran sadly has experienced. Um, Stephen, you read something on my website and I suddenly thought, must change that. Endometriosis, we always talk about endometriosis being of, of women of, product, of reproductive age. And I think we sort of maybe, by using that phrase, a very medical phrase of reproductive age, I think society tends to think of that as 20 to 35 to 40. Actually, um, medically reproductive age is puberty through to menopause. Um, and this is a disease that adolescents can have um, and the impact can in fact be felt for life because of course the scarring doesn't disappear when your periods stop um, with menopause. Sorry Fran um, about that. Um, and so I think really as a society we've sort of pigeonholed it and it's sort of been historically seen as something that sort of probably older women um, get when we've I think using that phrase reproductive age doesn't help. It's only in the 50s in America, it used to be called the career woman's disease because it was thought to be a psychosomatic reaction to have had a career rather than choosing children. And that's only in the 50s. So we're not going that far back. Um, so what, um, the, what does that average of seven and a half years look like? Well, sadly, Fran's given us a, a story. Yours was a lot longer than seven and a half years, Fran. But the average is, as we've heard, is not everyone realises what they've got is a disease. And so there could be some time, um, it's happened actually to one of my neighbors. Um, she, uh, her daughter said, oh, I get really bad periods. And she's like, I'm sorry, Lucy, we do in our family. You're gonna have to put up with it. So sometimes it can be, you know, that normalizing of pain. Um, I do think there's an issue around um, the number of people who go with um, serious pelvic pain and, are, and a young age put on the pill with no investigation as to why. And it feels strange to me that we medicate without finding the cause. And of course, endometriosis can for some um, help and be a treatment for, for uh, the pill can be for endometriosis. However, that doesn't, but we're still giving people something without them knowing and without them having the information about disease that whilst for many um, who will be able to get pregnant naturally, it sadly does double the risk of infertility. Um, and so people are not finding out that they might have the condition. I think the other thing that we heard is, um, and Fran, you said this um, when you were 18, you got uh, someone said, I'll have a baby. was a sort of answer. Sadly, and in very recent times, I've heard 16 and sometimes under 16 year olds being told they should have get pregnant as a treatment for uh, a, a gynecological disease. And I think in this day and age that that's unacceptable or should be. Equally, we get told by women who haven't prioritised and don't want to have children that they're downgraded if you like and they feel that they're being told we'll come back when you do and actually these symptoms that they're finding that are impacting their work their education aren't, aren't really listened to so i think the facility thing fertility thing is a double-edged sword for some it it um means that you know that it can't they can't have children and for others feel they want children sorry they don't want children but then they're not taken seriously um, so there's that. And I also think saying to someone who's got a disease that causes infertility, have a child when they might have been trying is also can be a little bit unsensitive sometimes. Um, I think though historically is, as I say, we have some absolutely fantastic healthcare prof professionals in primary care and secondary care doing some great work. But I think endometriosis and all benign, what we call in medical terms called benign gynaecology, it's very nice. Isn't it? Um, it seems to have had a, a very low priority. Um, within, if you like, what society is prioritised in terms of health. Um, and there's, you know, historically a very lack of research. We don't know what causes endometriosis. We won't find a cure until we do. But a huge lack of research compared to other conditions. So um, what, what do we do at Endometriosis UK? We are the UK's leading endometriosis charity. Um, I'd like, we're tiny. Um, you know, if you if you look at us, we have maybe well, we have eight staff. We have about half million turnover. Um, and if we look at a charity like charity like Diabetes UK, where roughly the same number of uh, women will have endometriosis diabetes, and they're um, compared to our well, we'll half them because they have men as well, don't they? But if we half them, they'll have like a twenty million turnover. They'll have 
200 300 staff if we've halved them and that's what you know that's because there's been that interest in in the disease for so long and we need to get to that stage but we have the same ambitions um, and I, what we want to see is we want to see prompt diagnosis time um, by prompt we do we, we'd say by 2030 it should be a year or less on average recognizing this is there is no current quick quick diagnosis um, we want everyone to have access care to care for, with the right skills and when it's needed we want more options for treatment and management and one day we do want to know what the cause is and find a cure and so research is important so it, to tie and highlight a couple of the areas that we're working on and we've heard um you know it did really resonate fran you were talking of being told you're too highly strong you know whatever it is is you know you were passing out sometimes fainting or vomiting due to pain and yet you were told that was normal um, and we shouldn't be in a situation where either healthcare professionals or the population think that that level of, of pain is, is normal and so for us one of the big campaigns um, we've done over the last couple of years was to get menstrual well-being included in the school curriculum uh, not endometriosis, specifically not, but menstrual well-being, and that's age appropriate, primary and secondary school, so that um, we try and overcome the taboos of talking about periods, because from endometriosis you get periods, you get poo and you get babies, I mean like not a good combination for kids to get their head around, but um, you know all the taboo subjects, but we need to overcome that taboo. And we need to uh, educate children and adolescents so they have the right terminology. We hear a lot from GPs that um, uh, people come to them not knowing what terms to use. Um, you know, we for some reason think vagina is a rude word. Talking to the Department of Education, we weren't even sure if we could have that labelled uh, as a, you know, in primary school, yet it is a factual part of our body. It's not, not a swear word. Um, and so we need to overcome that. And, and we were delighted that got approved in England, but it hasn't been agreed in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we are campaigning on that. Um, and we're at the final stages. We've been rebuffed four times for, by Wales. They're currently reviewing their criteria, uh, criteria, but we will continue, obviously, to campaign. Um, and I think now that, you know, the average age of periods is probably around nine, nine to 12 starting a period, but girls as young as eight. And sadly, a lot of uh, girls start periods not realising what they are. And we need to be in a situation where people know beforehand about that. So that's about making sure that the, the people know that what they're experiencing needs help. So if we've got that bit, and we've still got a lot to do on that, but we're getting there, um, then the next thing is about who, who's the first point of contact, which is usually a GP. And we've been working with the Royal College of GPs over the last couple of years um, and on a menstrual wellbeing toolkit. So um, providing a menstrual wellbeing tool, toolkit on the RCGP website um, as part of their women's health work. Um, and we've worked on a range of things in terms of um, e-learning for GPs on endometriosis, heavy menstrual bleeding and other conditions. And again, from a primary care perspective, just like with education, we say menstrual wellbeing, from primary care, meeting someone with symptoms, they need to look at the breadth of menstrual conditions it might be. And so that's why I've worked again on menstrual, uh, menstrual wellbeing toolkit with the Royal College of GPs. Um, what we've what i found is there's some amazing gps who are really helpful and have a huge amount of knowledge and interest and what we need to do is get that message out there to the other gps who maybe haven't taken a special interest in women's health um, and again working with the rcgp to do that as an aside we had a volunteer um last year a medical student who volunteered with us and she said she wanted to find out more about endometriosis because she had at medical school in london a very big medical school um, a one hour lecture on benign gynecology and at the end they said oh and 10 percent of women have en endometriosis and that's all she got taught at medical school now doctors have a huge amount to be taught at medical school but um, you know is there something a little bit more than we can do around gyne i think going forward so to get diagnosis time down, as I say, we want to say in a decade, I mean, Andrew is absolutely right. In the last decade, there's been no changes to diagnosis time. Um, the average is still seven to eight years in this country. We really need in a decade's time that to be a lot less. Um, so that's why we're pushing around trying to get awareness and diagnosis. Once people have a diagnosis, then obviously there's around treatment. Um, and Andrew's outlined that very well, some of the challenges. There are, I'm sure many of you know about the NICE, National Institute of Clinical Health, excellent, excellent. Um, and they have produced both a guideline in 2017 and quality standards in 2018 on endometriosis. Those haven't been implemented. 
um, we've done surveys recently and you know the NICE guidelines have give I feel a good baseline for care that should be in the whole of the UK it's been adopted in all of the UK but not implemented yet um, and it says in there that there should be prompt diagnosis that all all healthcare pr practitioners should recognize the symptoms of endometriosis and suspect endometriosis uh, when they see them and yet we know that doesn't happen and I think there's some um, work uh, we are certainly pushing with um, governments and NHSs in each nation about implementing those nice guidelines and we have a few like at the pinnacle of treatment Andrew and his um, uh, colleagues who run the BSG centres but they're there to you know specifically set up to deal with the 20% of people with deep endometriosis as Andrew said that means that we've got 80% of people with endometriosis who might see someone without the training they need yet in the nice guidelines it states that every gynae department should have someone with a special interest in endometriosis and that's a training competency based um, area and we feel that if that part of the NICE guidelines was implemented alone that would make a massive difference to supporting people like Fran and sadly many others um, to, to help in the diagnosis process and the point that Andrew is making about also if someone's doing a diagnostic laparoscopy that they then have the skills and knowledge to either treat what they see or know how to refer on should that need it. We've heard how deep endometriosis needs to be done at a specialist centre, but it is challenging because endometriosis, the, the signs and symptoms vary person to person and until someone takes a look, they might not think they've got deep endometriosis, but they might have, um, you know, so we do need people at all levels who can recognise that. Um, going forward. And the NICE guidelines have a huge range of things in about, as I say, prompt diagnosis, access to specialist nurses, about providing access to pain management for all. And one of the things that always um, completely riles me is that we have a chronic pain condition and yet pain management is rarely offered or accessed. Um, and so the average journey of seven and a half years and I'm talking averages, it's different person to person, is maybe um, a bit of time being told, sorry, love, you're just being a wuss or it's normal. Going to the GP with symptoms, depending on what they are, possibly being put on the pill and then that's left and then you've sort of got 10 years until you come off the pill and then it hits again and you join back the, the whole process um, or being tested maybe for other conditions, IBS, um, you know, other things, which of course people might have as well, but, you know, isn't the whole answer. Um, and then... Um, the odd person might go through the appendix removed, you know, all sorts of things and, and going through to um, uh, a specialist surgeon, um, hopefully, uh, if you've got deep endometriosis and then having surgery. And then if you've got pain, then maybe probably about eight to 10 years on looking at pain management. Why are we not doing pain management for a chronic pain condition early on? And, and I think that's um, a whole other issue that I will stop ranting about uh, before I go on too long. Um, and I think the other thing just to highlight is we've been talking about endometriosis of which um, the majority is, and it's considered a gynecological condition. It's believed that up to 10% of people with endometriosis will have endometriosis outside of the pelvic cavity. Um, and of those, uh, probably the biggest group is that with who have um, thoracic endometriosis, so endometriosis on the diaphragm or above. <clears throat> there is no pathway for those people. And I think that although we have some nice guidelines that if implemented, I think would make a big difference to a baseline of care for everyone with endometriosis. They would miss out that 10% of the 10%. So it's still like 150,000 people um, who have, have non-pelvic endometriosis. So I think there's some real work that we're doing there. We are um, working, as you can imagine, um, trying to lobby a whole range of people. Um, and we're doing some work specifically at the moment with the all party parliamentary group on endometriosis. Um, and we're launching a report with them um, next month. It was due to be out in June, but obviously COVID, we've delayed that. Um, and we are keen for, I know, the, um, to work with the parliamentarians across the UK to ensure that those with endometriosis that we raise awareness um, and that we uh, improve treatment. Um, just to end, you know, one of the issues with endometriosis is lack of awareness and we did some polling in March and it showed that um, 75% uh, of men didn't know what endometriosis was, sorry 74%. It also showed that around 64% of uh, 
16 to 24 year old women didn't know what endometriosis was either or could know any of the symptoms and whilst we in no way want to scare anybody about having their periods I do think as a society we need to get better at being open about just like any part of the body um, gynecological things can happen and people need to be aware of those so I think there's some some work we need to do but Stephen I'll leave it there if that's okay uh, thanks very much Emma that was really really interesting i thought the point that you made about lack of pain management was particularly pertinent really when you think how many years that there are that women have to go through to before they get diagnosis at the moment um, also quite horrific that someone as young as 16 should be told go and get pregnant that'll sort it out absolutely bizarre um we've got some questions um i think that the first question I've got is actually from um, the barrister who represented Fran um, within the claim, Helen Mulholland from King's Chambers. And I think it follows on from what you were saying, Emma, um, about the need to have um, somebody in every gynae team who um, understands about endometriosis. And her question is for, for Andrew, which is, um, a non-specialist doctor is now more aware of endometriosis, its symptoms and implications. And Andrew, do you consider that the profession as a whole is now more ready to recognise endometriosis and to refer on to, to units like yours? I think so. And we're training within sort of South Yorkshire, many more laparoscopic surgeons. So I think a lot of the the problem comes if you get referred to a specialist who doesn't have that skill set. They don't do laparoscopic surgery. Uh, professional pride is a terrible thing, and sometimes that might prevent referral on to a specialist who does. Uh, just the sheer numbers game. If you have over half of your gynecologists who are able to do laparoscopic surgery, maybe not advanced, maybe laparoscopic surgery, but that is the default to doing keyhole surgery as opposed to open surgery. That makes it more likely you will get a laparoscopy sooner. Uh, so I think we, the college are training more people in advanced laparoscopic surgeries um, and therefore we are, the, new, the newer consultants will be more laparoscopic trained. And with that comes automatically, if you do more of that surgery, you will see more endometriosis. So I'd like to think that will improve the baseline laparoscopic skills of, the, of, of so-called generalists in you know, non-specialist centers. So I think that will improve. And our medical students get a good hour of endometriosis lecturing. So, so <laughs> at least, you know, so uh, I'm hoping it is from the ground up. I would say it was relatively normal pre-period. Um, I, to be honest, I can't really remember. I don't think I noted anything in my diaries about that sort of thing before it really became an issue. Um, I really can't remember. I don't recall any issues with my bowels before the period started. From my diaries, I recall that I started writing about things like diarrhea and constipation after about the age of 18. So it's not something that was really an issue. Um, my period started when I was 12. So obviously throughout those years, there was no issue. It's something that started much later on after I had been diagnosed with IBS. I hope that helps. Have we lost Stephen altogether now? I think we have. Fran, can I ask you a question while we wait? Yeah, is, um, I know this is, this is like a, you know, I don't know if there's no answer, but, but for you, what, what do you think, if there's one thing that would have made a difference to your diagnosis or your whole process, what do you think would have been the one thing that would have really helped? I think that if I had, a GP at the very start who wasn't so dismissive, who did listen to me properly. I think that really would have made a difference all along. I do think that the problems I had started when he wrote a letter to the consultant saying, basically, he said, um, 
I would be grateful if you could review this nice 17 year old with aspirations to learn medicine who has convinced herself she has endometriosis. He obviously decided I was some sort of hypochondriac who wanted to diagnose myself with this interesting disease I'd read about in a book as part of my quest to become a doctor. And that kind of put the seed of thought in the mind of the um, consultant that I went to see. And maybe if I'd had a GP that was more supportive at the very start, it would have started that ball rolling of maybe I had mental health issues or highly strong or just a hypochondriac. I think that really would have made the difference. And that is something that happened at the very start when I was 13 years old. As it, we, we do have another question here uh, for Andrew Baxter. Uh, I can see the question on the, uh, on the printer. It says here, can Andrew Baxter give any tips for women who feel they're not being listened to? Um, I think from the, um, the GP point of view, it's always difficult if your primary care physician you don't get on with or he doesn't want to refer you in. Uh, I guess the, the only option you've got is, as a primary care level is change GPs. Um, I think it's easier in secondary care. You are perfectly entitled to a second opinion. So once your GP is on board and is referring you into secondary care to try and sort out your problem, it's you're perfectly entitled to seek a second opinion. And there are different NHS providers out there, um, you know, not just your local NHS unit. There's private hospitals offer patients NHS appointments. So you can get referred into different units. So I'd encourage people to push for another opinion is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the bottom line on that. Could I just add in as well? I think one of the things that we find that a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the GP services where there's more than one GP, they'll, they'll specialize. So a lot of GP services will have a GP that specializes in women's health. So if you're at your GPs and not getting anywhere, ask the receptionist if someone specializes in women's health. And if it isn't the GP you've seen, try them um, as well before to try and go on. I, I noticed that there's a question for me, if I can answer that, if that's okay. Uh, the question says, what advice would Fran give to people in her position? I would say, um, if I think back to my own experience, I wish I'd had the confidence at the start to maybe ask for a second opinion. Um, Unfortunately, I was at quite a small GP surgery where um, the two people that worked there were brothers and also their father worked there as well. So it really wasn't the best place to cause a bit of a fuss. But maybe I should have changed GP, changed surgery or even just kicked up more of a fuss and demanded some sort of referral. I don't know if it would have made a difference to me personally because of the type of people they were but if another lady isn't being listened to that could be a way forward if she is convinced that there's something more to her her symptoms and that could be looked at she would really just need to keep pushing just keep pushing until you're satisfied that you've pushed enough that's all I can really suggest there's another one here uh, another question asking, is endometriosis likely to cause pelvic pain despite excision stroke ablation surgery apparently treating all visible sites? Um, Emily asks, it's been a year since her diagnosis, treatment, laparoscopy, and she's still experiencing painful periods, ovulation, sex, bowel movements, etc. Uh, I think, firstly, I guess, not all pain is down to endometriosis. We see endometriosis in patients with no pain. So, you know, you've got to look and make sure you're not missing some other cause of pain. The wound, for instance, a laparoscopy is not going to treat any uterine pain. We fit lots of myrena coils uh, at the time of laparoscopies, A, to treat any adenomyosis that might be present, any just uterine pain, um, to try and stop endometriosis coming back. So uterus itself can cause pain. Having coexisting IBS, interstitial cystitis, 
all these other pathologies are more common in women with endometriosis. So I think it's important for surgeons not to be too surgical. Yes, they want to be able to take endometriosis out. Um, and in your case, clearly the key is to make sure it has all gone. Um, and um, if that's the case, then look at other pathologies. The other you know, warning, I guess, about laparoscopic surgery is that the damage done by endometriosis and then the damage done by the surgeons cutting the disease out can cause nerve damage. Um, not normally after one laparoscopy. So in this case, I think as having had one laparoscopy, you'd be very unlucky to be left with neuropathic damage to the pelvic nerves then causing pain. Um, in women with recurrent end laparoscopies, I, there comes a tipping point sometimes where you do actually might do more harm than good. So you have to be wary about this laparoscopy being held up as the, the magic cure. You've got to be wary that you're not cutting away bits of tissue causing more damage. And in those groups of patients, chronic pain management might be more fruitful. Uh, nerve blocking agents, amitriptyline, gabapentin, various nerve blocking agents might um, so I think after one lap, I'm be, be, um, very unlucky to be at that sort of hypersensitive pelvic pain stage. I think look at other pathologies, um, but sometimes a nerve blocking agent early on in the, in the treatment pathway is worthwhile. I mean, that goes back to having laparoscopy. I, mean, I, I know the diagnosis we've said is the golden standard for diagnosis is laparoscopy. Um, and in defense of the combined pill, if you like, um, I think the combined pill just used blindly as a, here you go, have a packet of pills and go away without any thought process to what's involved, you know, shouldn't be encouraged. But I think in the younger teenager who you really don't want to set on the course of recurrent laparoscopies, if you can help it. If you can get pain under control whilst acknowledging it might be endometriosis, faced with the normal ultrasound scan that excludes ovarian cysts that really should be treated even at an early age, if a patient is controlled on the combined pill, I have no problems with treating that, treating medically without a laparoscopy. But uh, you've got to, uh, had that discussion with the patient there's you might have endometriosis you're not trying to get pregnant if we can get your pain under control for now um something like the combined pill is perfectly good again going back to this issue you'd really rather not laparoscope teenagers if you can help it um and anybody any more times than absolutely necessary I don't know if that makes sense uh, i've got another one um, there's a question about fertility and, and, and um, time scale to diagnosis to help avoid fertility complications. I think it's very, very dependent on the individual. Um, purely for fertility, um, it depends what sort of disease you have. Some people form an ovarian cyst very quickly, and in that, if that, in that case, should get treated early. If your main issue is pain with very little volume of disease, the, the, the issue about the staging, you may pick up on staging of endometriosis. That is a fertility scoring. It, the volume of disease is traditionally not dis is disproportionate quite often to the amount of pain. So women can have a few spots and a lot of um, and a lot of pain, and they can have a completely stuck pelvis and no pain. Um, so purely from a fertility point of view. It depends if there's anything on scan, anything volume of disease seen on ultrasound or MRI, I think it would be worth treating to make sure your anatomy is as good as possible. Um, in terms of the superficial painful disease, you can get treated for pain for that and that will improve your fertility as well, but it's very individual, is, I'm afraid is the, is the bottom line on that. Uh, what is the range of symptoms that women could experience when menstruating that are just an unfortunate side effect of a period as opposed to being due to some underlying pathology? Could women suffering with symptoms as severe as frowns without there being an underlying condition? Yes, is, is the easy answer, if you like. It's rare, um, and it'd be rare to have such significant impact on your life with so-called, you know, a normal anatomy and no endometriosis. 
Um, but sometimes you have patients who do have a laparoscopy and you look and you take biopsy, there's no endometriosis. But I think the key is to be wide and to open to the condition being present, excluded if at all possible, and then at least directs you in the right treatment route. I think putting it down to just periods is, is the problem. Um, going back to Emily who had um, someone then did an endoscopy, a bowel endoscopy to investigate bowel symptoms. Um, I find a percentage of patients might have inflammatory bowel conditions and they have a bowel endoscopy and they find something invariably, if you're talking about pain, cyclical pelvic pain that you think might be down to bowel, invariably patients go along, they have bowel prep and when they have an endoscopy, it's completely normal because it's been emptied out. If patients have slow transit time, if patients have IBS for a better title, if you like, uh, their bowel will be normal and on, on endoscopy. So patients with a functional bowel issue, endoscopies like to be normal. Having said that, their endoscopy might be painful because if they have developed hypersensitivity of their pelvic nerves, anything in the pelvis is going to be more painful for them, perhaps, than an average person. Um, this is Sanya Strakiewicz. I'm one of Stephen's colleagues. I'm afraid um, we have lost him, so I'm a poor substitution. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, Fran, I was absolutely astonished by your um, pretty horrific experience, and I'm sorry that you had to go through it all. Um, I just also want to thank Emma um, Cox and Mr. Baxter for your most insightful and um, a very informative talks this afternoon. Um, and thank you to all of you who um, joined us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.